All right, let's get this out of the way right up front. Two of them. All right, there it is. Now you don't have to wait for me to say it. But it's true, we do have two of them. This is a pair of devices that I found in two different places, two years apart, and I almost left both of them where I found them. This happens all the time. I'll see something in a store, or someone will offer me a thing in an email, and I'll go, nah, that's boring. And then a few minutes or a day later, I'll have second thoughts, and frequently the things I almost ignored end up making the most interesting videos. But you can hardly blame me, because these are some dire-looking gadgets. Uh, for instance, the first one here, this is the Microsoft TV Photo Viewer, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. You put a floppy in the slot, and it reads JPEGs off of it and displays them on your TV. Exciting stuff. And the other one is the Cool iCam TV Cam, uh, which does the same thing, plus a, a bit more, obviously. But I still looked at it, and I, I thought, what is there to say that's not obvious? Both of these devices were responses to the same market demand. They were both trying to solve a problem that I think existed only briefly, and as a result, they're the only devices of their type in existence, as far as I know. I actually thought the Microsoft One was unique for a long time, until I found this one lingering in a thrift store, and something compelled me to buy it for far, far too much. It was half off day, but that still stung, especially since I still didn't know what to say about it. But at long last, I realized that these things are interesting in contrast to one another. Only these two companies ever tried to solve this problem, but they came at it from very different angles and different ends of the market. So I thought it'd be neat to show them off both side by side. So let's start by looking at the Microsoft device since it is indeed quite a bit simpler. As noted, the bulk of the machine is a floppy drive. Underneath the slot, we have a power button and a couple navigation controls. And around on the back, we have a power input, a video in, and a video out, and that's it. Like I said, not a complicated gadget. Now, I should note that I don't have the whole kit. Uh, this was sold with a remote control, uh, plus some software and some demo disks, and none of those came with it. But after it sat in my office for a year, I actually came across the demo floppy at a totally different place than where I got the device, along with what appears to be a third-party disk meant to be used with this thing, which is very intriguing. And the software CD is archived, as it turns out, so we're good there. And as for the remote, it's not critical, as you'll be seeing, so we're pretty much good to go. Now, hooking this thing up is simple enough, or at least it would be, except the power jack is center negative for some reason. Now, I've gone off on center negative DC jacks many times before, and the argument that's been made in my comments is that it made sense on old battery powered devices where the switching contact, which I think is always the outside, right? Can connect and disconnect the positive side of the battery pack instead of the ground. I guess there's advantages to that, and that's all well and good. Maybe that mattered, but this doesn't have any batteries. So I'm gonna go back to the well. This sucks. Fortunately, however, I'm a very attentive person who was able to give it the right polarity the very first time I hooked it up. I didn't reverse polarize the input at all because I'm a stickler for details who never makes mistakes of that type. In unrelated news, it turns out this thing has diode protection on the power input. Not that I would ever need that. Oh, right, we also need video output, and that's just straight composite. That seems odd, though, because S-Video was virtually ubiquitous on new TVs at this point but I'll speculate on the why of that later. So let me just uh, go find a good RCA cable. Udon, this is not a convenient time. Hey, no, no, that's the power cable for the camera. Don't disturb it. You're disturbing it. No, no, you're biting it. Stop. Less Udon. Wild animal, dangerous beast, causing destruction, chaos. Oh, ow, ow, owie, claws. Well, you put two puncture wounds in my hand. I think you can go now. All right, I've removed the raccoon from my office and I found a cable so we can proceed normally. All right, with it all hooked up, we just hold the power button to turn it on. And there's the UI, or, uh, well, lack thereof. There's no menus, nothing interactive, just tells us to put a disc in. So let's start with the Quick Tour. It can't sense that you've inserted a disc, uh, which I suspect is due to the um, the legacy of the PC's modifications to the uh, the floppy drive interface. I think they replaced the, uh, what was it, the, the disc in signal with a disc change signal that you have to pull. At any rate, uh, you have to press a button to get started. But you'll notice 
Once it loads the first image, if we listen to the drive, it actually keeps running because uh, they very wisely designed this to buffer all the images on the disk into memory, or at least as much as it can. So if we stay on this first picture for a bit, as people often do, we won't need to wait for it to load every time we hit the next button. So unsurprisingly, this device being very simple, there's not a whole lot to it. Uh, it just tells you what it can basically do. It gives you an easy way to share digital pictures. You create a digital photo album on a floppy disk, and then you can view the pictures on your TV. This is the remote I was talking about, but the only thing it has is the forward, backwards, and auto buttons, which are on here, and then a rotate button, which, um, well, I think we'll survive without that. Now, this is an interesting feature because I'm not sure I quite get it. It says that you can search for a picture by holding the forward or back button, and then it'll display each image in a thumbnail in the lower right corner. Now, okay, that almost makes sense, right? Until you realize that uh, it doesn't actually take that long to load the individual pictures. Like, if I just hit next, you know, it maybe takes a second. And uh, because you're holding down the button rather than pressing it repeatedly, it has to insert a delay anyway. So uh, this pip only actually advances at about one image per second. So it's not actually any faster. And it's also so small that you really can't make out what's going on. Like I can't really see what's in those pictures very well. Even on like a 36 inch, it's only gonna be like this big. You'll barely be able to see it. So yeah, the whole thing seems kind of not well thought out. The next few slides are basically just an overview of what you could do with this thing. You know, it tells you, hey, your digital photos will look great. Advertisements for the thing you already bought. Uh, this next slide, however, this is actually kind of relevant because it says panoramic shots will be resized to fit your TV. Well, a person buying this thing is not likely to have a panoramic camera. Those have always been specialty equipment. I think there was sort of a fad of, of consumer grade panoramic cameras back in like the um, 70s or 80s, you know, here and there, but it's never been a common thing. Except at the specific time that this came out, it kind of was. Probably an awful lot of people out there are familiar with the term APS, uh, referring to a uh, size of digital camera sensor, but that term actually originated with the advanced photo system, um, one of Kodak's many failed, I'm gonna call them failed film formats, where they basically tried to sell film that was worse than normal 35 millimeter to a public that didn't want it. They tried this over and over. They did um, disc film, they did 110, uh, and then they did APS, all of which were stupid and pointless. Can you tell that I used to be an aspiring amateur photographer? I realized that all those formats were fine for the average person taking pictures of their kids or whatever but you know what was also fine 35 millimeter all of these were just meant to help kodak usurp the market that they had lost i digress anyway aps was really dumb it uh came in these uh, funky little cartridges that almost look like 35 millimeter except that of course they're incompatible with all existing cameras so you have to buy a new one it uses a smaller film frame than 35 millimeter and Apparently the wiki page does not have a diagram of this, so I'm sure I've got one on the screen right now showing you how the two frame sizes compare. Uh, but the important thing is that you didn't actually have to use the whole frame. It was already worse than 35, but if you wanted, you could make it even worse because the cameras had this aspect ratio selector that let you pick APS, H, C, or P. And what those would do is when you took a picture, it would burn a little bit of data onto the film cartridge. I don't remember if there was actually a, a, like a memory chip in there or if it just like wrote a little bitmap onto the film. But either way, uh, every frame would say which ratio it was. And then when you went to print your photos, the processor's machine would read those values and it would crop the image appropriately. And the three aspect ratios were H for high definition, that one was 16 by nine, uh, C for classic, which gave you a uh, three by two, uh, so basically a normal um, uh, photo aspect ratio like people were used to, and then P for panorama, which would crop the top and bottom of the image throwing away tons of information and getting you absolutely nothing in the process. Can you tell that I think APS was dumb? Anyway, the point is uh, that came out in 1996. It was still in full swing at this point. And so there probably were an awful lot of people taking panoramas uh, on their vacations and a less well-designed device may have dealt with those by just cropping the sides of the image. So it's great to have the reassurance that you're going to see the whole picture. Anyway, after that, we have some suggestions about how we could use this thing. You know, we've got the default, uh, bore the hell out of your friends, make them not want to visit you. 
Uh, then we have this, which is actually far more interesting. Make flashcards for your kids. Okay, you could do this on your PC and then just keep the flashcards on your PC. But in 2001, it was far more common for people to have one computer that everybody shared. So you make the flashcards on your computer, you put them on a floppy, then you go put it in the device next to the TV, and now you can continue using the computer while the kids are using the flashcards, theoretically anyway. I mean, wouldn't you be proctoring the flashcarding? Hmm, now that I think about it, maybe this doesn't make any sense. But anyway, I do think it's neat that Microsoft designed this as a photo viewer, and then right in the tutorial disc, they propose, you know, emergent applications for it. You gotta respect that. Now this final one I have beef with because Use TV photo viewer as a screensaver for your TV is simply wrong. That's just a lie. You can't do that. TVs don't need screensavers because unless you leave your TV tuned to like CNN 24-7 year round, there's not going to be any consistent objects on the screen to get burned into it, right? And I know I'm being deliberately obtuse here. They're actually using the colloquial definition. A screensaver at this point was thought of by many people as a diverting little animation that just plays on your computer screen when you're not actively using it. And that's fine, but I'm still gonna be a dick about it. Anyway, the rest of this is just instructions on uh, how to actually use it, uh, which is basically put the software in your PC and follow the instructions because it basically explains everything to you. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. But first, I wanna take a look at this other disc here. This intrigues me because I don't have any evidence that this actually came with the device itself. It says created for Microsoft TV photo viewer. My instinct is to think that Microsoft contracted this person to um, produce media to use with their device, but it just doesn't scan what with the lack of graphic design. If this had been you know, included with the device, I'm sure that Microsoft would have produced the disc and they would have put this watermark on here or otherwise uh, you know, put a copyright notice at the bottom because it does name their device. So I think this was produced by this um, Nick Kelsch or his publisher and just intended to be used on one of these devices, which is really weird. Like what could the deployment base have been like? At any rate, let's look at what's on here. I've looked at this disc already, and again, one time aspiring amateur photographer, I can't help but be critical, to put it kindly. This is a teaser for a book called How to Photograph Your Family by one Nick Kelsch, and the reviews on that book seem overwhelmingly positive, so I have to imagine the disc was put together by his publisher or something, because the advice it seems to offer feels almost disingenuous. I mean, it starts out all right. Uh, it begins uh, by saying that, I believe that photography, like all the arts, is most profound when it's basic. And I can't argue with that. The best photographers I know just take pictures of stuff. There isn't a lot of prep or pretense. So, okay, we're good here. And the image that follows is a terrific example. If you wanted to make this a bad photo, it's easy. Just do what most beginners do. Put the kid smack dab in the center of the frame. That would put a huge chunk of sky above his head that wouldn't contribute anything. It would cut dad off at the waist, minimizing his role in the scene. And most importantly, it would hide the near end of the fence, which would eliminate any narrative. By applying the rule of thirds, as they've done here in both axes, we get crucial context. We can see the kid, we can see who's helping him, and we can see where he's headed. And that turns a still photo into a frame from a movie. Your mind's eye conjures up an image of what's gonna happen next. That draws you into the scene. That's good photography. And you can do it with any camera in the world and no special settings. You just tilt the camera like this. Takes 20 seconds to learn, great advice. And sure enough, the next slide offers some more fantastic pointers. It says amateur photographers make three basic mistakes. They don't get close enough to their subjects, they don't shoot enough film, and they don't consider the emotional effect the quality of light has on their pictures. Now, I would have said shoot more photos instead of using the shorthand film, but whatever. Points one and two are solid. Point number three kind of slides into pretentiousness. Like, that sentence seems very intimidating and judgmental, and it's not even what the guy meant, because he says right under it, the actual tip is to just turn off your flash. Now, next up, we've got some sample photos, and, uh... Yeah, this picture is not very good. You should get closer. Once you do, it's a clear improvement. Uh, from the caption, I suspect that if they'd had room on the disc, they would have included an even closer shot, and that would have looked even better. So we're still good. Likewise, shoot more film. Uh, that's an essential rule of the art. If you're setting out to get pictures that you'll be proud to print and frame, you simply have to press the shutter. 
many times. This is always true. Even minute changes in how you're holding the camera could make a difference. But when photographing people in particular, you have to take a lot of pictures because people move. They change unpredictably from second to second. You probably won't even notice most of what they do until you see the finished pictures under a loop. The tiniest change in expression could be the magic that makes a whole shoot worth it, and it might only appear in one out of 60 shots. So yeah, even in the film days, when you had to pay for every single frame, if a picture was worth taking, it was worth blowing a whole roll on it. So we're good, so far. But then it's point number three again, and things kind of diverge. Because, let me be clear. When Mr. Kelsch says to turn off your flash, he means the on-camera one. And this is pedantic, but I don't think this picture was taken on one of those. The reason on-camera flash sucks is because it obliterates all the color and depth in an image by casting very harsh light from almost exactly the same point of view as the lens. But since we can actually see a clear shadow here, I think this was a strobe on a tripod like two or three feet to the right, which suggests Mr. Kelsch didn't actually own a camera with a built-in flash which is very funny, but the point is still valid. When this disc was published, the target demographic, the notional mom or dad, owned this exact camera. And this kind of point and shoot was notorious for turning the flash on by default and firing it in all conditions, even under harsh sunlight. So in general, turning it off would add back a lot of warmth and humanity in your photos. The problem is, it's the photographer who has to decide when the flash is and isn't necessary, and that's not an easy decision. For instance, just turning off your flash will not turn this picture into this one. <laughs> in the first shot, we couldn't tell what the lighting was like in the room. That's the problem with flash. It's so bright, it overwhelms all other light sources. But now we know that the room was pitch black, except for some candles, and no. Your Olympus is not going to nail this Barry Lyndon shit, okay? Consumer cameras are very dumb, and even more so back then. They don't know your intentions, so they assume that every picture is taken outside or in a well-lit room, and thus they try to achieve the same neutral exposure level for every photo. So in this scenario, your crappy point-and-shoot is going to do one of two things. It'll either get so confused by the pitch-black void behind the kid that it'll leave the shutter open for two or three seconds until the picture is a blurry gray rectangle with some massively overexposed candle flames in the middle. Or the bright points of light from the candle flames will confuse it into underexposing until those are all you can see. You just can't auto-expose this picture. Like, no camera can handle this. You're going to need one in full manual mode, you're going to have to put it on a tripod, and then you got to get the kid to hold absolutely stock still while you take a series of pictures at shutter speeds of at least a quarter second. If I was doing this on film, I'd take no less than 30 shots if I wanted to be sure I got something. And that's pretty much what bugs me about this disc. It jumps from very simple advice to a kind of draw the rest of the owl stuff. The pictures after this one kind of escalate, and each one looks more heavy-handed and artificial. And I'm inclined to think that almost all of them were shot with uh, elaborate multi-strobe flash setups, which is fine. Those aren't that hard to use. I'm sure you can teach them to the proverbial proud parent. And if that's what the book does, then great, no beef. But if it suggests that you can get stuff like this without an in-depth understanding of how exposure works, I, I kind of can't get on board with that. I'm almost tempted to go out and get a copy of the book and find out, but this isn't a book review channel, so it'd only be for my satisfaction. So let's move on and take a look at the software. And to that end, we'll need a period-appropriate machine. So how about one from five years later? The Dell D620 is one of my most beloved laptops. It is pretty well built. It's very well performing for its era, but most importantly, it has hot swappable drives. So I was able to use the uh, CD-ROM to load the software, and then I'm able to use the floppy drive to put the files onto the disk. Not by any means a unique feature, but uh, the cool thing is that Dell sold millions of these things to businesses, and you can find the machine and the drive modules for next to nothing on eBay. Uh, also, the uh, floppy module has the added benefit. I've mentioned this before. It doubles as an external USB device, which you can use on any machine. Oh, wow. Uh, you might want to be careful, though, because uh, the backlights aren't necessarily doing so well anymore. The original CD included two programs, the Microsoft TV Photo Viewer app, which is specific to this device, uh, and Microsoft Picture It, uh, which is a uh, typical consumer image editor. Uh, I'm gonna start that first because I don't plan on deep diving it. There were about a million easy photo editors in this era, and Microsoft's is not particularly unique, except for one thing.
I love this video. It's it's so ridiculous. It's fully 2001 core and flash pilled. It it looks so embarrassing in a product made by a corporation to have these like cheap clip art images flying around and just stretching and whatnot. Like it's amazing that we ever thought this looked state of the art. A little hint for you. We never did. It always looked ridiculous. The app itself is exactly what you'd expect. You know, it's it's just uh, supposed to be a way for people who don't know anything about image editing to do some basic image editing. So uh, if we come in here and pick something, it gives us all these various options. And, you know, I imagine you could probably do pretty much anything you could do in Photoshop with this. It would just be, you know, a pain in the ass and, and kind of underwhelming if you were a serious digital artist, but perfectly adequate for the average person, right? I don't think we really need to tour this whole program. There's um, hundreds of things in here and you know you can probably kind of guess what they all do and they're not really relevant uh, to this specific device. So I'm just gonna do one thing while I'm in here. Udon's eyes didn't come out nearly large enough. In, in the real world, they're about the size of basketballs at all times. So let's just fix that. There we go. This, this is what Udon looks like. Udon rarely shows up in my videos because uh, she is a very special cat. She is a spirit. She drifts from place to place. She cannot be predicted or controlled. The one thing I'll mention before I bail out of this though is that the design language of this program is completely unique. I don't think any of Microsoft's other software at the time looked like this. Uh, it's sort of um, like a 1997 kind of energy, like what you'd see in like one of the first versions of Front Page, I suppose. It had to have been developed by some independent team inside the company unless they just bought it from somebody else, uh, which honestly seems kind of likely. And the same is true for the TV Photo Viewer app. Uh, this is, of course, a lot more task-oriented, uh, but again, it has another completely unique design language that looks like nothing else they'd made. This program is far simpler. All you do is add pictures and put them on a disk. That's basically it. So we'll pick all these except for the incorrect Udon, add those to my album. I pressed the wrong button. I love how it's supposed to be very easy to use, and I immediately misinterpreted it, right? Like I realized what I'm supposed to do is to hit add to album, and then I could go to somewhere else in here and find more pictures and then add those. But the way I interpreted it was, these are the things I want, so I'm going to hit the big check mark. I, I think that's understandable, right? They could have fixed this by making the plus sign here green. I think that would have drawn my eye. There are virtually no editing features in here. Pretty much the only thing we can do is uh, rotate an image, and we can crop it. And there's actually something very interesting in this crop dialog. Notice that the options are allow any shape, so that's free form, you can uh, do anything you like, or keep same shape as my TV, which forces it to a four by three aspect ratio. Four by three, not 16 by nine. There isn't even the option for it because, well, no American consumer would have had a 16 by nine TV at this point. Some people in Japan had them, but that was it. You simply could not get them here in 2001, if, if I recall correctly. Hang on, hang on, is that true? I'm suddenly doubting myself. I feel like maybe plasma TVs were out? Yeah, okay, um, per this uh, catalog entry here, you could get a 42 inch plasma TV in 2001 for $7,500. Um, <laughs> probably that would not be the same market as the target for this program. So yeah, it was safe to assume that it would be four by three. And of course it makes sense that they would have this as the default setting because, well, uh, we know that people don't like letter boxes and pillar boxes. So this is probably what somebody would want. If they came in here and cropped an image, they would want it to fill the whole screen no matter what. So as a default setting, that probably does make sense. And the last editing feature is the ability to add a caption. We can do this uh, for each image individually. And you can actually see them in the thumbnail there, although it's not legible, you can hit preview to see what that's gonna look like. And that's it, that's everything we can do. Uh, at this point, we just hit uh, create floppy disk. We'll uh, put our uh, disk in here. If the disk has stuff on it, then it asks if we wanna wipe it. It was very courteous of them. Five minutes later. All right, there we go. Now, before we put this into the device, I wanna show you what it actually put on the disk. If we open this in Explorer, uh, obviously we've got the JPEGs themselves. And the first thing I wanna point out is that the captions have actually been burned into the file. Now, this was very disappointing to me because I'm not sure if it's cut off part of the image or just scaled it down. I guess it's probably scaled it because of the, um, uh, the pillar boxes, but I had really hoped that it would just write the caption to a data file on the disk 
and then uh, render it on the fly. But maybe the thing didn't have enough power. I, I don't know. Uh, so in any case, the uh, captions are permanent and you can never recover the original quality images from the disc. Kind of a bummer, but probably the target market would never have known the difference. So, you know, whatever. Also, over here, uh, we've got the uh, TP. This is the uh, title page uh, that has all of the uh, thumbnails on it. Now, I'm kind of intrigued because when I made this disc, I, I saw in the dialogue that it said it was generating a file called thumbs.jpg, and I don't see that. Now, was that an intermediate file, or is it hidden? Oh, there's hidden files. Whoops. Hey, look at that, thumbs.jpg. Whoa! What? Okay, all right, well, this explains a lot. Remember earlier when I was complaining that um, the, the preview feature where you hold down the button and you see the little pip in the corner didn't make any sense? Uh, it did make sense because what it's really doing, uh, dollars to donuts, is uh, it's loading this whole contact sheet into memory because it can fit in the space of a single photo. And then what it's showing you in the corner is just the picture sliced out from this file. And the reason it's so small is because it's not doing any scaling. I doubt that uh, this device can do any scaling. I think every picture has to be exactly the same size. So what you're seeing on the screen when you do that are just uh, these individual images cut out of this atlas and then just displayed one-to-one -one on the screen. This, of course, means that uh, it can have them all in memory at once. So, in fact, it would be faster than, than loading each image individually. But even more intriguing are these images down here at the bottom. It turns out that this thing doesn't have enough internal storage in wherever its firmware is stored uh, to hold these images. So they have to provide a copy on every single floppy, which means I could edit this and uh, make it say, uh, you know, rude things whenever you press uh, next image. Well, that's fascinating. Um, I had no idea that was on here. What I did know was on here, however, uh, was this HTML file called click here to view pictures. And that's what I wanted to show you, uh, which of course uh, does not actually work <laughs> on uh, XP service pack three because they uh, added a whole bunch of security improvements since this was first released. Okay, and now that we've enabled JavaScript and whatnot, we can uh, now view these here in the browser. Uh, although you can't actually click on them. I forget this every time I look at it. You'd think you could just click on a thumbnail, right? That they would have used the uh, uh, HTML image map, but no, uh, you've got to just go through them one by one. I thought that was kind of silly. Now, before we look at our finished album, there's one other thing I'd like to check out. I noticed a, a setting in here that's very curious. Let me just uh, remove these pictures from the album. And then let's create a new disc. And in advanced settings, there's an option that says hide captions. Text will still be saved with each picture. What's that going to do? Huh, okay. Uh, so there's the uh, JPEG. And sure enough, it's full res. It doesn't have the caption. But I'll bet if we open it in IE, no, no, nothing there. Huh. Where'd the text go? Oh, I wonder if it's in this um, index.bin. Well, that's definitely not it. Oh, I wonder if it put it in the uh, EXIF data. Uh, no, seemingly not. You know, I wonder if all that means is that the text will be saved with the picture in the local copy of the album. I'll bet that's all it is. That is a weird and confusing way to word that. Like, um, as the, the consumer here, I expected the text to wind up on the floppy disk somewhere where I could retrieve it. So I would not realize that uh, if I hit no here, that whatever captions I created are gone. So, hmm, kind of a miss there. Anyway, let's uh, take a look at what we've created. Now, right off the bat, uh, I gotta say, this uh, contact sheet does not look amazing. I mean, I'm looking at the uh, the captured image, maybe it would be a bit less offensive on a CRT, just because you couldn't tell how low quality it is, but um, yeah, it does not look very good. And uh, the images themselves have a, a certain uh, kind of blurry quality to them uh, that I don't think is the fault of my capture chain or anything. I'm using a RetroTINK uh, 5X here, and those are pretty damn good. And everything else looks fine through it, so um, I kind of think that the device itself is not delivering, you know, peak image quality. Again, it seems kind of weird that they didn't include S-Video, right? It was uh, very compatible at the time with modern TVs, and it would have improved the quality quite a bit. But I think I know why they didn't bother, and it has to do with the intended market. Let's take a look 
at Microsoft's press release for this thing at its release in 2001. They were pretty proud of it, so most of the article is, of course, about how it'll cure your psoriasis and help the country win the war and all that, but there is some useful data in here. Basically, they made this thing because digital photography was popping off in 2001, but the media situation hadn't caught up yet. They cite one source predicting that 10 million digital cameras would be sold by the end of the year, and a survey stating that 20% of houses with computers also had digital cameras. That's actually more than I would have guessed. They still seemed pretty exotic to me back then, but clearly they weren't, right? A lot of people had them. Problem is sharing photos, which is a pretty important part of the photographic process, was still pretty tough. Internet connectivity wasn't nearly as universal as it is now, so emailing pictures wasn't always practical, and MMS didn't exist, so you couldn't just text someone a photo. So in most cases, you were limited to hard copy of some kind, and that had improved a ton. There were cheap inkjet printers and dye sub printers and whatnot, but printing was still cumbersome, slow, and expensive. If you took some pictures at a wild girls' night out and wanted to share them with your second set of girls who were busy having a different wild night out that night, printing them didn't make much sense, right? So you're pretty much stuck getting everyone to crowd around your 15 to 17 inch PC monitor while you flipped through the pictures, and obviously that was pretty inconvenient. After all, we hadn't yet invented the smartphone, so you couldn't have everyone crowd around a six inch screen instead. Ah, the onwards march of technology. Now, in, say, 2010, you could just, you know, plug your laptop into your TV's HDMI input. But back in 2001, essentially nobody had a TV that would accept PC video. Some folks had computers with TV output, but it looked awful. And since laptops were a lot less common, there was a good chance that you simply couldn't get your PC close enough to your TV for that to be practical. So there was a strong desire for a device that would sit next to the TV and do nothing more than display JPEGs from removable storage. But... Why a floppy disk? Why not a memory card? Well, I can only guess, but I think it's just that 2001 was a very in-between moment for memory cards. To be clear, image viewers that took flash memory were already around. I actually reviewed a photo printer from 1999 that could do this. You could plug it into your TV, then just pop the card out of your camera, put it in the front, and be done with it. You get the exact same experience. And flash memory was nothing new or exotic in 2001. Even USB thumb drives were getting pretty popular, but they weren't yet ubiquitous. By 2005, they were. You could expect the average consumer to have a card reader at that point, um, maybe a USB one, but often just built straight into their PC. Back in 2001, however, a company just couldn't expect to browbeat any given person into buying one of those. They just weren't that useful yet, especially when you consider that many people weren't even using flash-based cameras. Sony's uh, floppy Mavica was still selling, and a lot of folks were still shooting film and just getting it scanned to photo CD. So a lot of people just didn't need memory cards at all. But everyone had a floppy drive. The Mac dropped them, but we'll ignore that. In the PC world, they'd only just started disappearing, and even then, only from super compact machines. And in any case, it was just reasonable to expect the average consumer to have one or go buy one. And most digital cameras were still crappy enough that they could fit a decent number of pictures on a single 1.4 meg disc, so this ecosystem still made sense. Now, this would change fairly quickly. A year later, flash was a lot cheaper, cameras were a lot better, and 1.4 megs just wasn't really enough anymore. To wit, uh, Sony put out their last floppy Mavica in 2002, before switching over to CDR, and even that last model also took memory sticks. So, the end of the floppy was nigh in 2001, but it hadn't quite happened. So, I think that this was the last year where you simply couldn't expect someone to have anything better than a floppy, yet digital photography was hugely popular. So, this is the only stopgap that made sense. I mean, it is, in literal terms, a stopgap. It simply closes the gap between your PC and your TV. You put the photos on a disc, you carry them across the room, and now you and the girls can chill on the couch with your margaritas in comfort. It's very clever, and that's not all. I suspect that Microsoft envisioned another function that an awful lot of people would have appreciated, although it's not one they necessarily could have put in the press release. I think that this thing would have been very useful at grandma's house. You see, nowadays, a lot of grandmas use computers and smartphones, but in 2001, most older folks barely knew how to turn on their VCRs. But they did usually know that. TVs and VCRs had been ubiquitous for decades in the US, and they were incredibly easy to use. All you had to do was stick a tape in and press play. And the TV photo viewer is just about that easy to use. 
at $160 MSRP, it was cheap enough that you could buy one, take it with you when you visit the rents in Florida, and leave it hooked up to their TV. Now, there's downsides to sending your parents photos on disc. They can't exactly put a floppy into a photo album, right? But on the flip side, if their eyesight is failing, a 36-inch TV is going to present a much bigger and brighter image. So, the accessibility advantages alone are significant, and indeed, Microsoft's own press release quotes a Rolling Stone reporter saying the product had great grandma appeal. Forgive the stereotype, but this was very apt. Trust me, all right? There's only one problem. Your grandparents could work the VCR because it was the only box they had, and it usually occupied the only input on their TV set. And even if they had a modern TV with two or three inputs, uh, that just complicated matters. Nobody wanted to be stuck on the phone trying to work out whether uh, they had the TV on the wrong input, or the photo viewer wasn't actually turned on, or the damn cable fell out, or they got swapped with the VCR. And this is why we have the pass-through port. I had really hoped when I first got this thing that video in meant that it could capture frames of video and save them to the floppy disk. I'm still kind of disappointed about that, but no, it's much simpler. When you turn this thing off, it just couples the video input straight to the video output. So that solves the problem, right? You plug this thing directly into the TV, then you hook the VCR up through the pass-through, and now when the photo viewer is on, it shows up, but as soon as it's turned off, the VCR cuts right through. So if dad calls and says, uh, the VCR isn't working, you just go, is the TV telling you to put in a disc? And if so, you tell them to press the power button and you're good to go again. It's honestly a brilliant solution to a problem that plagued Gen Xers and millennials in particular. And I think it's why Microsoft stuck with composite rather than adding S-Video. That would add more complications, more ports to mix up uh, for a marginal improvement in quality. This on the other hand is uh, pretty hard to hook up incorrectly and I think that justifies it. And that's pretty much that. Like I said, the thing um, pretty much speaks for itself. It's very much an artifact of exactly 2001 and the same is true for its evil twin. I happen to think that Cool iCam TV Cam is a, <laughs> a terrible brand name, but uh, per the manual, they were considering something even worse. They were gonna call it the TV Catam. Yes, I know you're supposed to just say, ah, but I mean, reading that is like tripping on a crack in the sidewalk. Companies may have awful marketing practices nowadays, but uh, that's just because they're completely out of ideas. This, this is a very 2000s kind of marketing. It's, um, it's twee. You might even call it cringe. I mean, this name contains not only the internet I, not only the email at, but it even calls itself cool. This is greetings, fellow kids, the device. The people who made this thought the Spice Girls were still it, not realizing that Forever only qualified as top 40 because it slipped in at number 39. Anyway, the TV at cam also came out in 2001, and it also tries to deal with the uh, getting pictures onto the TV problem, but it makes a number of um, left turns from right lanes, if you will. For one thing, uh, you'll see that the floppy drive also serves as a docking station for a camera which is notionally the focus of the whole product, and in fact, it's totally necessary for any of this to function. This sucks because, um, well, not surprisingly, this camera is dire. We need only give it a 360 degree spin to know everything we need to know. The uh, tiny monochrome LCD and the optical viewfinder qualify this as what I call a drugstore camera, the sort of thing sold opportunistically in the checkout line at Walgreens. These were around for, it had to have been at least 10 years, maybe longer, and they were, in no uncertain terms, fraud. They all look exactly the same. Uh, they've got the tiny, you know, numeric LCD, no EVF, uh, fixed uh, focus lens. Uh, every single one has the same landfill grade sensor. If you're lucky, this shoots at 640 by 480, but it's a very special kind of lucky that nobody wants to be. And this is why I almost didn't buy the TV cam at all, because I knew the camera itself would be atrocious, as in the adjective form of atrocity. And spoiler warning, it is. The only reason I bought this thing is because I had to know what the floppy drive was about. I thought, could that be the only way to get pictures off the camera? But then I took a closer look at the device and I realized it says there's a USB port here on the side. In fact, uh, <laughs> as it turns out, eh, eh, there we go, a full size USB B port. That was kind of shocking. Uh, so I looked it up because I'm like, surely they could have gone with the mini one. Well, the mini connectors didn't actually exist until USB 2 came out, and I'm thinking this design probably predates that, so I guess it's not surprising, but it does look ridiculous. Besides that, uh, we also have a docking connector here on the bottom. That's kind of hard to see, but it is a very, very cheap looking edge connector with an even cheaper looking uh, sliding door over it. Fun fact, when I got this thing, that was jammed shut and I could not get it open for like 10 minutes. 
Uh, then over on this side, we of course have a crappy lanyard. Uh, and we've got a holder for four triple A's. Then on top, we have some buttons. Uh, these crappy cameras always have some amount of customization. Um, usually there's at least a resolution setting. And uh, indeed, this thing shoots at 640 by 480 by default but you can set it to high or low compression or reduce the res to 320 by 240 in order to fit more pictures on the tiny internal storage because of course it has no removable memory card or anything. Uh, that's universal for these as well. They always have like four megs of built-in memory and that's it. Uh, I can assure you this is pointless though because the, the latter two settings are gonna be completely illegible. Nobody would ever use them on purpose, but the manufacturers would always include the option in case you want to accidentally bump the button and make your disappointing photos even worse. Uh, you can also accidentally set a self timer to ensure you'll miss photo opportunities completely. And you can accidentally set a uh, 2X digital zoom so you can not notice that till you get back to your hotel and find the storage filled with ghastly illegible blobs. Not that that's any different from what it normally does. Anyway, finally, we have a power button that emits a extremely upsetting beep when you turn it on. And that's pretty much all there is to the device itself. So uh, let's get a couple sample photos to work with. I'm gonna start by just uh, photographing this thing. It takes so long to take a picture, wow. Uh, what else do we have? I'm sure these photos are gonna look like um, a view through an oven door, so let's get something nice and ruin it. Here we go. Frame maker for Unix. I'm actually trying to use the dire viewfinder, so I'll be very interested to see if this actually fit in the frame. All right, that's uh, probably good enough. Uh, time to see what we got. Now we could hook this thing up to the computer, uh, and we will, but clearly the dock was a major selling point, so let's take a look at that. On the front, we of course have another floppy drive, but on the back, we have two of the most miserable connectors possible. The first one is one of those unnecessarily undersized DC plugs. This thing just runs off nine volts and uh, nine volt power supplies with uh, 2.1 millimeter plugs were uh, pretty common the time this came out. So it'd be reasonable for somebody to have a replacement for that. But uh, yeah, if you lose the AC adapter, you're just screwed, right? Uh, besides that, we've also got the uh, TV output uh, and of course, that's using the very common 2.5 millimeter phone plug that we all remember using for video. You know, the thing you'd find on like an ancient Nokia cell phone headset. I mean, everyone has a 2.5 millimeter mono to single RCA adapter lying around, right? I uh, don't, so it's adapter time. For the DC jack, uh, we'll just use this DC plug adapter. And now my bench supply will fit it. And then for the other one, we'll just use this uh, DC plug adapter. And now my bench supply will... And then into this one, we're going to plug another DC adapter with screw terminals, uh, which I then attached to an RCA plug with screw terminals. So uh, any thought of judging this thing's objective video quality just flew out the window, but we can at least see what it does. All right, we're hooked up. Uh, let's plug in the power. And nothing happens. Okay, uh, let's dock the camera. And still nothing happens. We actually have to turn the camera on. It doesn't turn itself on when it's docked. And even better, uh, it's not actually powered off the dock. So you have to have good batteries in the camera. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. Anyway, here's what it outputs, and right away you can see there's a lot more going on uh, than with the Microsoft thing. We've got this whole menu bar at the bottom, like we're about to play a little LucasArts adventure game about photography. So what we're seeing right now are pictures from the camera's internal memory. So we can use these uh, arrows uh, to flip through pictures I've taken. Uh, you'd expect that to be instant, but the camera presumably has an incredibly crackerjack CPU. Uh, there's also options here for a slideshow, which I think is uh, this button here. And there's also these options for rotating the image. Uh, that takes quite a while, as you'd expect. And if you just want to look at a picture, you can press this uh, great big oval button here, and it hides the uh, user interface, or at least theoretically it does. It doesn't actually hide the UI, it just cuts it down to only the item that you had selected. So we can still actually do everything from here. It uh, just doesn't show the whole bar. I thought that was a clean feed button, but it isn't. That kind of sucks. Anyway, let's uh, see about those pictures we just took. Here we go, here's one. And it's, um, it's horrible. I should point out that I had this thing centered vertically. So yeah, the viewfinder is not collimated with the lens at all not the least bit surprising, uh, which means that this one, yep, is gonna be cut off on the top. 
You could probably get away with taking pictures at long distances with this because the parallax error wouldn't be nearly as bad. Uh, but um, this still sucks. And of course, the picture itself is just total crap. I mean, um, I'm sure a lot of it is due to compression, but that doesn't really change anything. It looks like shit, and I don't think anybody would want a picture that looks like this. And, and you saw the other pictures as I flipped through them uh, to get here. I mean, everything this camera produces is going to be blurry and ghosty and out of focus and, and streaky and the colors are terrible. And nobody who's seen any of these drugstore cameras is surprised because I think every single one of them has the exact same image sensor. At any rate, though, this is pretty much just the functionality that you'd expect to find built into the camera itself. Because most digitals, right from the get-go, really, uh, whether they were cheap or expensive, had a TV output feature that worked more or less just like this, but the jack was normally on the camera itself. Putting it on the dock does make some sense though. I mean, you could leave this plugged into your TV and when you get back from a trip, you just plunk it down and it's immediately connected and you can look at your pictures. That's cute, uh, but of course it wouldn't be worthwhile on its own. The floppy drive is what makes this make sense. Let's uh, put a disc in here. And now if we select this icon here, it copies that photo to the disc. You'll see in the lower right, it actually gives you a little status icon to indicate that that's what it's doing. That's nice. They didn't need to do that. Many devices wouldn't have. I have absolutely no idea why it went back to picture number one when it finished copying. Oh, I guess because that's the last picture on the disc, so it cycled around. Uh, I was actually uh, just about to say that uh, they could have made you step through every single picture uh, and, and just hit download over and over and over, but in fact, you can just pick the next icon here and that'll copy all the images off the camera to the disc. Well, it looks like you can also just hit it one at a time and it'll step through automatically, so that's actually a nice touch. Another thing I really like is that as soon as you interact with the floppy disk for the first time, it puts this gauge in the lower right corner to show you how much space is left on it. It's really cute. So this is all very clever, but we're not done. If we go over to the leftmost icon and pick that, that changes to a disk icon. And now we're reading files off the disk. In fact, uh, I've got one of the uh, disks that I uh, produced with the uh, TV photo viewer app on here. And as you can see, it's it's struggling to load it. <laughs> Presumably uh, the JPEGs that that produces are much less compressed than the ones from the camera. So that's probably a lot bigger, but you know what? It pulled it off. So now this thing looks very appealing, right? Uh, you get home after a trip, you plunk the camera down, you can flip through your pictures on the TV, and then anything you like, you can just hit the button and it'll dub it off to the floppy, which you can then take over to your PC uh, to manipulate later. Uh, or you can just tell it, uh, hey, go ahead, copy everything over and then go make coffee or get a beer or whatever. And when it's done, you just pop the disc out. It's, honestly, this is a brilliant design. And, and everything we've seen here is great, except that, the camera doesn't take pictures that are worth a shit, right? That's the, the real letdown of it. Like, imagine if you had all this but with a camera that didn't suck. Now, to be fair, it could just be the composite video output that's doing it dirty, so we'd better look at the pictures on the PC. Let's just pop this floppy in. All right, there it is. And um, that's not better. Honestly, it almost looks worse on this screen. Like, that is that is really terrible everything feels soft, right? Like the um, uh, the button on the floppy drive looks like it's actually out of focus. And uh, given that the uh, lens on here is fixed focus, it's entirely possible now that I think about it that it could be set for, um, you know, 20 or 30 feet uh, and just doesn't have enough depth of field to get all the way back here. Although it is one of those little tiny, nearly pinhole lenses, you know, 6.4 millimeters. So I'm not sure if that makes sense. Uh, but everything these cameras do looks blurry, so who knows? Uh, likewise, our, our frame maker box, yeah, that uh, that doesn't look any better than it did over the TV output. So, no, it's it's not that that's doing it. Unless, of course, uh, maybe the pictures got recompressed when we wrote them to the floppy. So we should probably get the RAWs, <laughs> the JPEGs that is, uh, from the camera itself. Oh, a couple fun facts about that before we do it. Uh, this didn't come with the driver disc, so I don't have the original software. Now, we're not missing much as far as applications. It was just uh, some ArcSoft image editors, um, pretty much just like Microsoft's picture it. Uh, but these were also the days before generic USB drivers, uh, well, at least for many things like this. So I couldn't use this at all without the drivers. But I plugged it into my desktop PC, and it turns out it has an embedded identifier string that calls it a Tiger Electronics Fast Flicks. Now I looked that up, and I actually found a driver that worked. Although, when we actually plug it in, 
the name it pops up with is Sound Vision Stream Driver. And this isn't surprising, of course. I mean, I'd guess that 99% of these drugstore cameras were the same dedicated IC and sensor combo made by one Taiwanese company by the billions and then sold to thousands of ODMs who pretty much just uh, made plastic cases for them and very little else. Tiger was probably one licensee among many uh, who then sub-licensed it or, you know, made 10 million fast flicks and then um, found themselves with a whole bunch of chips they didn't need and just resold them for pennies on the dollar to whoever made this thing. And that's worthy of a further detour, actually, because uh, normally I would abandon any hope of finding out who actually made something like this, because it looks like what I call stamp engineering, where the same product is sold with 5,000 different brands printed on it, and the only difference between one and the other is which stamp they loaded in the pad printer. But in this case, I was actually able to track down a little bit of info, and it turns out to be a pretty intriguing story. Cool iCam seems to be a sub-brand of Worldwide Licenses Limited, a company from Hong Kong that started out making cheap licensed crap, Winnie the Pooh backpacks, that sort of thing. But they suddenly pivoted in the early 2000s into digital cameras out of nowhere. WWL were apparently the actual manufacturer behind all of Polaroid's crappy digital cameras, which makes sense. I knew Polaroid wasn't doing it, but I always wondered who was. Apparently, they were even trying to get in bed with Foveon, and I'm incredibly curious where that went, but I can only get page one of the Harvard Business School study that talks about it, and I can't find any other references to it, so I guess I'll never know. But what that study also mentions is that Cool iCam was another brand from WWL meant to sell cheaper, crappier cameras as toys and whatnot. So given that this company actually had, apparently, actual engineering abilities, it seems likely that this thing is a genuinely original design. Even if the core is some off-the-shelf pre-built module, it really looks like they put some work into it, which is always weird in this kind of market segment. All right, and I finished the video and then shared it with some people, and now I have to go back and add this segment because I've been given some incredibly juicy details that you need to know. First, Worldwide Licenses sold this exact same product under the Polaroid brand as the Model 345. It's exactly identical, including the sticker that still says TV Catam on it. So that's hilarious and not the least bit surprising. But the juicier detail is that they actually did close that deal with Foveon. Now, if you don't know, uh, Foveon is a sort of a meme in the digital camera world. Uh, they're a company that developed this fascinating triple stacked sensor design uh, that uh, does color photography without needing a Bayer filter grid. Really neat stuff that never really went where people hoped it would go. However, this company actually succeeded in getting one of their chips into a production camera, a low cost consumer camera, you know, cost a couple hundred bucks. I think it was like a couple megapixels, something like that. And the story I've heard is that it was never actually supposed to be sold. They manufactured it, they shipped it to retailers, and then they pulled the plug and said, don't sell it. But some of them didn't get the memo and they went ahead and sold it. And so these things have actually made it into consumer hands. Uh, an amazing little footnote to the misbegotten Foveon brand. Anyway, so um, we're feeling optimistic, right? Let's see if this camera actually does do better than the average bear. Ah, that is the exact same image. So no, this thing just sucks. And uh, this isn't even the most it can suck because it has one other feature. It also works as a webcam. Now, don't get too excited because this wasn't rare at all. I think pretty much all these drugstore cameras could do it. The problem is you wouldn't want to. For instance, <laughs> oh boy, we better scale that up. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, that's the stuff. Oh, oh, it's just horrible. Let's uh, try and get a more stable image to look at. Something, something that this can, ah, there we go. I really do think that this thing is incapable of bringing any image into sharp focus. This is this is incredible. Here, let's uh, get our frame maker box again. What is going on in like the left side? You see the sort of um, uh, hysteresis in the pixels where there's just sort of parts of the image left over. Is that an artifact of compression? So um, you'll be pleased to know that this is actually shooting apparently at uh, 160 by 120 resolution, or at least that's what it claims. It's funny because this is the mode that it started up in, uh, but virtual dub says that 320 by 240 is the default. However, if we select that, it it doesn't look better. It just looks, um, 
interpolated, I would say. So I, I strongly suspect that uh, this thing is not actually capable of getting even half resolution off the sensor. Uh, I think it can only do quarter res uh, in real time, and that does not surprise me at all. There are some bizarre things going on with the image processing. I don't think this is a, a compression artifact. Look at the trails on the red letters. That is unreal. Honestly, that's a pretty cool effect if you could leverage it. And I could play with this for hours, but I should probably get back to the video. The point is, the video from this thing is absolutely god-awful, and I can't think of any valid use for it, except maybe using net meeting. Um, that is actually mentioned in the manual. Uh, and, okay, I suppose if you were doing a net meeting video call over dial-up, like 33.6, you probably couldn't get anything more than 160 by 120 over that anyway, so this probably wasn't making things worse. Except, of course, that as you saw, the lens is the most flare-prone thing I've ever seen. And the auto exposure is extremely aggressive. So if there is a single dot of bright light in the image, it'll just crank the exposure down until you can't see anything. Oh, and uh, I can't actually show you a raw video capture from this thing because virtual dub crashes as soon as I hit record. And I'm gonna blame that on the camera. Uh, but I think the VGA capture is probably adequate. I don't think it's making the picture any worse. So this thing is useless. And don't get it twisted here. I know how much cheap digital cameras sucked in 2001, okay? I owned a couple cameras back then. One was actually worse than this, despite having an HP brand and costing over $100. So I don't need the state of the industry explained to me, all right? The fact remains, though, that the bottom half of the digital camera market was just useless and disappointing, and nobody would have, or at least should have, felt good about buying something like this. The cool iCam TV Catam is a very clever idea, in my opinion, that's completely hamstrung by the awful camera that they paired with it. It's really a shame, because otherwise, it would have been an interesting inroad towards competing with the Sony Mavica. I think only a company of Sony's size and capability could have actually made cameras with integrated floppy drives, since that's such a feat of miniaturization. But if this company had made something like this with the dock and everything, but with like a two megapixel sensor, that probably would have been a legitimately desirable product. The one saving grace is that if you bought this thing, you would at least get something equivalent to the Microsoft TV photo viewer as part of the bargain. That's a value add, I suppose, uh, except that uh, as noted, this thing won't output video unless the camera is docked and powered on. Even if you're just looking at pictures from a floppy disk, you have to plug the camera in and turn it on and put fresh batteries in it. If you wanted to bring some pictures over from your PC and look at them on the TV, you're going to have to sit there with the camera running down its cells for no reason. And this is bizarre, but it's also unavoidable due to the way this thing is designed. So, on that note, let's now take a look at how these two devices are built. We'll start again with the Microsoft Photo Viewer. This thing is strange by the standards of the time and who made it. There's only uh, four screws in the whole thing. There they are. And we can now um, um, uh, hmm we can now do nothing because it just won't come apart. In fact, it is ready to come apart. It's just that it's stuck together with tape, you see. There's there's strips of double-sided tape all along the top of the thing. And then to actually see anything, we have to take the drive out and that's held in by uh, another pair of these huge nasty double-sided foam tape strips. This is unreal. I cannot believe that Microsoft built something like this. I mean, to give you an idea, when I put this back together, I'm gonna have to put the floppy drive back on and there's nothing to guide it into place. It can just go wherever. And if you get it just a little bit too far forward, then um, the faceplate won't go on and the clamshell won't go together. Oh, and the faceplate, yeah, that's held on by more double-sided tape. It's really? Microsoft did this? I really don't understand because they did stick the case together with your, your typical clamshell design. It's got the four um, bolts to go through the far side. And then the drive itself has screw holes that have a clear path to the bottom of the chassis where they could have holes that you could put screws in. And in fact, wait a minute, wait a minute, they're cast into the chassis. This 
and that line up with the matching holes on the drive. Are you kidding? Wait, did they actually prep for this and then just not do it? Yeah, there's bosses, but they don't have any holes in them. They, oh my God, yeah. The foam tape is riding on top of these blind bosses. What? What? When I first looked at this, I was aghast. And now I'm, um, what's after aghast? I don't even have an adjective for that. That is, um, they literally didn't need to do this. They had the holes. <laughs> yeah, okay, that one's got me baffled. Wow. Anyway, so here's our motherboard. And boy, that's a lot of stuff. I almost think that Microsoft was losing money on this thing just from the bill of materials. Uh, we've got a Zilog Z180 CPU. Uh, I had to look that up. That's apparently sort of like an upgraded and slightly modernized Z80. Uh, we also have a Xilinx Spartan 2, uh, and what I believe is about two megabytes of RAM, if I did my math right. There's also a 27LC020E prom that presumably holds the uh, firmware. Uh, and finally, an analog devices uh, 809708AR, an 8-bit analog-to-digital converter uh, that would be used to uh, produce the video signal. Oh, sorry, there's also a floppy drive controller down here. Almost forgot that. Uh, so this is all very straightforward. This is um, pretty much how I would design it if I were doing this sort of thing. Not that I have any idea what I'm doing. The Z180 is probably running the basic software, you know, putting the images on the screen and uh, loading stuff from disk and just orchestrating everything. Uh, the FPGA probably contains a JPEG decoding core, an image rotating algorithm, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then the images are buffered in the RAM chips and output through the DAC. Um, I could be wrong about that, but if so, I'm, I'm sure I'm not very wrong. This thing's so straightforward, it might as well be on rails, all right? Now, let's take a look at the cool iCam. The way this comes apart is uh, less cursed, but considerably more irritating. Uh, there's a couple screws here, but uh, those do nothing, and we don't actually want to take those out, uh, because if we do, the, uh, the drive will just fall out as soon as we open it. Instead, you have to get your thinnest precision screwdriver uh, to fit down into these very tiny cavities here from which you will extract six of the thinnest, most miserable looking plastic screws you've ever seen. I think I could snap that in half. Awful. All right, there we are. Except that was only four because of course, what am I saying of course? Uh, why did they do this? Why did they hide two of the screws under rubber feet, but none of the others? Sometimes I think this shit is just malice. I think industrial designers just like screwing with us. <laughs> anyway. Uh, something fell. Oh, right. Uh, I regret to inform you that the eject button in this one is also held on by adhesive tape. I forgot to mention that the floppy drive in the Microsoft device is a completely ordinary off-the-shelf PC drive. Makes sense. Why get something custom? Uh, and the same is true here. But as far as silicon, uh, we've got a PIC microcontroller here. What is the exact number? That is a... Uh, pick 16C65B-20 slash P. <laughs> Love those labels. Uh, and then this guy here is interesting. That's a uh, National Semiconductor 97338. That is, in fact, a Super I.O. chip. That's the thing that gives a PC all of its legacy ports, uh, the serial, the parallel, uh, many other things like that, and, of course, the floppy drive. So this is serving as our uh, floppy drive controller on here. Oh, and um, I would be uh, remiss in not mentioning the oddity that is this voltage regulator. That is a 278R05, which is uh, sort of like the extremely well-known 7805 voltage regulator. You know, it takes in uh, anything from 7 to like 36 volts and just spits out a clean 5 volts from it. Except this is a low dropout model, so it'll take anything from 5.5 volts and spit out 5. That in itself is a, a neat thing. You know, I don't know why they would pick it. Uh, maybe it was just cheap that day because this is taking nine volts, so they don't need the low dropout feature. But what it also has is a disable pin. Um, if you uh, ground this, I think it shuts off the output. I, I don't exactly know why one would need that, but that might actually be hooked up. And I have a theory as to, to why they may have picked this. So we'll come back to that. The most interesting thing about this is that uh, there's nothing else in it. I've already had the board out. It's really tedious, so I'm not going to do it again because uh, there's nothing on the other side except the uh, connector for uh, the docking port. This is all there is, and it's not really enough. Like, there's no meaningful circuitry here compared to <laughs> the Microsoft thing, which has, hell, a whole FPGA going on. Uh, and uh, I suspect the reason for that is that this thing doesn't do anything. 
It seems self-evident that all the functionality of this device lives in the camera itself. There's no video generation circuitry down here. There's no significant processing power. There's insufficient RAM to store even a, a medium-sized JPEG, let alone the computer, the storage to rotate it. So all of that has to be in the camera, making this just a breakout box. That's um probably why they used the regulator with the uh, disable feature, because I'm guessing that none of this gets powered until you dock the camera. It probably has a pin on here uh, that just um, grounds that to turn on the dock. I think that this pick does very little, and it's only here out of necessity. I'm figuring that they couldn't find a smaller, simpler version of the Super I.O. chip. Like they, they probably wanted to get a dedicated floppy drive controller, but for one reason or another, they couldn't. So they had to go with whatever was cheap, these chips that were being put in PCs by the billions. And that put them in a pickle because this has to connect to the camera somehow. Uh, trouble is, uh, this docking port, as you can see from uh, the pins here, only has 16 lines. Uh, the Super I.O. chip requires way more than that. I mean, uh, since this is meant to go on a PC, it uses an ISA interface, and that requires 16 lines for the address bus alone, uh, and even more for data, clock, etc. I'm sure they found ways to cut down on that, but at a minimum, they'd have to read the data port, which is 8 bits wide, so that would eat half this dock plug all on its own. There's just no way to fit it all in there, especially since uh, a couple of these pins must be sending the analog video to the dock. So um, there really is just no way to get this through there to this. But um, this pick chip, this has 33 IO pins. So my guess is it handles all the communication with the super IO, uh, and then it scans the uh, front panel as well, just for convenience, and then chops all that up and sends it to the camera with like a really light eight bit packet protocol kind of thing. I don't have the skills to confirm all that, but honestly, like what else could it be doing? And it also seems like a sensible enough way to do this if you needed to do this. But it's just kind of weird that they needed to do this. See, this is uh, the contrast that I spoke of earlier. It's true that these devices aren't doing the same thing, right? But the point is, Microsoft put more sophistication into this uh, simple thing than this company put into their entire more complex thing. And even if Microsoft was making something like this, they never would have solved this problem this particular way. If they made this sort of thing, then uh, the whole kit would have been like three to four hundred dollars because both halves would have had their own processors. The video would be generated in the dock because that's the right way to do it. You know, why would you put the analog circuitry in the camera? You can't actually use it on its own. That's just preposterous, right? And the floppy drive, you know, they, they could have done something like this, or they could have put two whole megs of RAM and a full CPU in the dock and had it download pictures from the camera and, and you know, the whole thing. Or they could have used a, a USB floppy controller. You know, those would have been very new at the time, but they could have shelled out for it and then uh, put enough smarts in the camera to have it speak USB. There's a, a dozen very corporate ways to do this, but what cool iCam did feels like how a hobbyist would have solved it. So I, I kind of love it, to be honest. Like, <laughs> I, I think they achieved pretty much everything Microsoft did with what looks like a lot less complexity. Except, now we kind of want to know how much smarts are in the camera, right? I mean, maybe there are FPGAs in here. We really have no idea. And I haven't taken this apart yet, since I fully expect, if I do, that it will not go back together. Uh, but I have no attachment to this thing, short of its value for a video, and I've now recorded that video. So... Let's take it apart and see how far I get before I tear a ribbon cable in half or find something that's irreversibly glued together. There are a lot of screws on this thing. Uh, I'm guessing these ones on the back are probably important, but um, I need an even smaller screwdriver. You know it's a well-made device when none of the screws fall out. That was, uh, that was sarcasm, by the way. This could be masterfully well-designed or... It could be a complete nightmare inside. I have no idea what to expect. All right, here we go. Maybe anyway, something's still binding. Oh, wait, uh, <laughs> there's a screw in the tripod socket. Ah, oh, you clever bastards. Well, it wants to come apart. It really does. Oh, there we go. Oh, all right, it's just the um, little plastic buttons. Those fell out. Uh, and then the, um, uh, this is the tripod socket. So, okay, that's not too chaotic. But, uh, yeah, let's get a look at this board. <laughs> Man, that thing is, uh, kind of packed. There's a lot going on there. Let's take some more screws out. So this is interesting. They've actually used, uh, the PCB itself, I realize, as part of the structure. Because, uh, this 
tripod socket, for some reason, is not cast into the case. It uh, is recessed into this sort of modified octagon here. And then that is bolted to the PCB rather than um, to the rest of the chassis. I guess that was just an expedient way to, uh, uh, to fixture this thing. But um, why did that need to be two different pieces, I wonder? Hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. That has almost got it, except we're going to have to take off the button board. I guess I shouldn't be surprised that the uh, the button board is just a bunch of uh, little tactile switches built onto a PCB like that. They feel really good, so I can't complain. Anyway. Whoa! Hell yeah! This is awesome! So I guess, uh, yeah, Sound Vision must be the actual manufacturer of the, uh, the underlying technology. And um, I noticed the ARM logo. So this is the central processor. Looks like it's called a Clarity 2. So we can definitely look that up. But first, what else do we have on here? Obviously, we've got the um, imager there. Um, this is another uh, Sound Vision labeled chip. So we'll probably just find a reference to that when we look up this thing, assuming we find anything at all. And then on the back here, <laughs> they've, just, they've just taped this uh, piezo buzzer down over what a appears to be I was gonna say two RAM chips but it isn't it's one RAM chip and one flash or prom chip boy that is just um <laughs> the cheapest piezo they could possibly find gross that is a Hyundai HY 57 v 65 something that does not directly come up with a data sheet but uh, every result I find shows it being used in an SD RAM module so yeah that's your RAM and then that appears to be an ST M 28W320. Okay, and that is a uh, 32 megabit uh, flash memory boot block. So yeah, that's your uh, that's your ROM. All right. Well, now it's time to look up this chip and get absolutely no results. Oh, that's neat. The very first result is uh, from a Linux driver thread. Those were so useful back in the day. People doing all sorts of deep dives, figuring out what was uh, really going on with, uh, uh, you know, no-name devices like this. In this case, they're saying this is a, uh, a chip from an Agfa ePhoto CL18. Agfa uh, put their name on some really horrible digital cameras. Uh, in fact, um, the one I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the HP that I hated, was also sold as an Agfa. I have no idea who originated the design. Probably neither of them. Anyway, the Agfa CL18 type cameras are an early design known as 1307. They tend to be simple 640x480 USB designs. It actually uh, uh, makes reference to the fast flicks. So I'm going to look at that in a second. But um, is there any hope for a data sheet? Oh, wait. All right, this is for the Clarity 4. This is a bit later, but uh, a family of ASICs designed for OEMs that require a proven imaging solution. Well, yeah, we knew that designreuse.com <laughs> tasty url oh okay this is actually from 2001 which suggests to no one's surprise that this was uh, considerably outdated at the time uh, they were two major revisions ahead already oh indeed it says oems using clarity 4 can leverage the production architecture of clarity 2 so that probably got deployed in billions of devices uh the clarity 4 had an arm 7 uh processor Oh, uh, it suggests you could actually use it for MP3 playback, barcode reading, or voice recognition and synthesis. So I guess uh, Sound Vision was a whole company that just did this sort of thing. Oh, it makes mention of um, products originally based on the Clarity 2 ASIC, such as the Sound Vision V1 and M1 digital cameras. So I'm guessing that um, this board here probably is a reference design based on one of those. Uh, probably every component here uh, was on the same bill of materials from Sound Vision. Let's see uh, if we can actually find that. Oh my God, that's a Google whack. I don't know that I've ever gotten one of those. And it's exactly on point it's from designnews.com. It's talking about exactly what we're looking at here. Without sourced engineering, designing digital cameras is a snap. This is from 2002, so the time is right. How is it that in recent months, products like the Concord IQ and the Konica E-Mini have enjoyed success as sub $200 digital cameras? How do these companies manage to quickly pack performance into new products? Answer, they don't. Buddy, <laughs> I know how you meant it, but I know how I mean it. Those cameras were probably no better than this one. Uh, looks like uh, Sound Vision was a company out in, yes, I remember the state abbreviations. That's Massachusetts, right? 
Yeah, here we go. Last spring, it released the M1 digital camera reference design, the core of those successful Concorde and Konica cameras. Priced to make cameras in the $150 range. Oh, and it turns out that the uh, Clarity 2 here is a 48 megahertz ARM processor. So now we know. Ah, and unsurprisingly, this is using a CMOS sensor instead of a CCD. Uh, CMOS sensors are universal nowadays, but uh, back then they were still kind of up and coming. CCDs were getting used at a lot of things. And they go right on to say that uh, it's cheaper, but it looks a lot worse. And SoundVision's solution to this was to uh, try and fix it in software, which is probably why the picture looked so weird when we were in webcam mode, because it was constantly doing stuff to try and fix up the CMOS picture. Um, it's probably incredibly noisy under the hood. And of course, they wanted to parlay this into everything under the sun. So uh, yeah, you could put the clarity into a, a karaoke player, um, video cameras, um, barcode readers, all sorts of things. I guess if you get an unlimited license to sell ARM CPU cores in 2002, you probably feel like you're on top of the mountain. I mean, shit mountain, but uh, it's a mountain nonetheless. Wow, okay, uh, that pretty much answers all my questions, except... I wonder who made this sensor. If I take that apart, it is probably not going to go back together. But there's screws, so... Maybe, maybe not. Let's see. You know, I just realized, before I take that apart, is that an adjustable lens? Sure looks like it. I see a thread. Um, oh, I think that's been Loctited in place, so... All right, here we go. Who makes it? Agilent. Huh, interesting. That is an Agilent HDCS 2020. Sure enough, that is a CMOS image sensor. Uh, what do we got? Looks like it came in two different sizes, 640x480 or a SIF 352x288. That's a weird resolution, which I'll talk about some other time. I've done enough Googling for today. And I was really hoping to find out that this one wasn't actually the 640x480 version and it was just doing interpolation, but no, uh, it looks like the 2020 is specifically the VGA res. So it really is 640x480. Looks like there's actually a bunch of interesting features on this thing. A programmable window size. You can have it capture down to a 4x4 four four pixel window. You can pan anywhere on the sensor programmatically. That's, um, that's pretty neat stuff. I mean, uh, probably doesn't make it good no matter what you do with it, but it's still cool, I suppose. Oh, you know what? Before I uh, put that down, I, I want to go back to that Linux thread. I'm curious if they're just going to have a massive list of cameras using this thing. Well, I don't know about massive, but uh, there's certainly a few. Uh, there's that Tiger Fast Flicks, um, uh, Polaroid, a uh, whole bunch of names we don't recognize. Uh, Mustech, RCA, Pretech. Ooh, oh, Argus. Man, Argus was one of the early zombie brands. They used to make um, actual film cameras, and by the time this was produced, I think they'd been dead for like 40 years. Wow, they even managed to make a shitty camera under the Fujifilm brand. I wonder if they were actually making uh, decent digitals at that point. Maybe not. Nowadays, they're a respectable name. The idea of them putting <laughs> this crap into a, a product and actually selling it is uh, kind of impossible to imagine. So, yeah, it looks like, as I figured, this, this does have the same core as a billion other crappy cameras. But uh, also, it looks like uh, it was fully programmable. So, yeah, I, I think that Worldwide Licenses actually did put in some engineering effort here. Uh, I think that the whole dock and whatnot was their invention. I think they probably built that from the ground up. I am wondering, um, all of a sudden, now that I think about it, where's the analog video coming from? Because I don't see a DAC on here. Oh, right, duh. It's it's probably built directly into the Clarity chip because, uh, like I said, digital cameras were expected to plug directly into your TV. Uh, they just um, put it through the docking connector instead of putting the, the jack right on the camera like most people did. So um, the only thing that they really changed from the reference design uh, was getting it to talk to the uh, the floppy drive controller. Nonetheless, that is a, a non-trivial amount of effort, and they added quite a bit of value to the design, so I got to respect it. But anyway, yeah, there's uh, those two devices. I don't think either one was uh, necessarily worth a whole video on its own, but I think, like I said, when you put them together, it's fascinating looking at the uh, wildly different approaches to doing this. You know, um, uh, Microsoft's thing is, is pretty much a uh, from the ground up design, uh, whereas these guys use as much recycled functionality as they could. It makes a lot of sense. And um, the quality of the two products is in terms of functionality is, is very similar other than a couple of quirks. So hats off, really good work, worldwide licenses. I wonder what happened to you. So I don't know uh, for sure that these are the only two devices of this type in existence. Probably not. There's probably something else out there, but uh, they're the only ones I've ever found. So as far as I'm concerned, I have now covered an entire genre of product beginning to end. 
I hope that was fun. Or if not, I hope you had a good time anyway. If you did and you're new to my channel, consider subscribing. I try to do stuff like this whenever I can, and given that the summer in Seattle is brutal this year and my unair conditioned studio is basically uninhabitable, uh, there will probably be more workbench videos to come in the near future. So remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload those. Uh, but if you really enjoyed this, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks are doing. This is my full-time job, so they're paying for my groceries and rent and gas in my car, without which I would have to get a day job, which would make it impossible for me to make videos of any quality at all. I'm incredibly grateful to all those folks for supporting me. I could not do this without them, so thank you all so much. And everyone else, thanks for watching.